is your brother. Did you call me? Shamsur Rahman. Where you come from? You live here in Birmingham? I saw you yesterday for the first time. You just started coming to this ministry? Hmm. Are you a relative of Sharif? You guys look alike. And alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiru wa nastahdihi subhanahu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyi'ati amalina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu may yudlil fala hadiya lahu wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahtuhu la sharika lahu wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد فإن خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلال وكل ضلالة في النار يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم معقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يوت الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد From what we didn't mention yesterday أخواني is another issue concerning the تسليم and in preparation for the تسليم and that is the issue of what is known as التورق 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 is a particular type of sitting that the Muslim makes in the prayer, a tawarruq, from the precision or the diqqa of the Arabic language. The Arabs have a name for almost any and everything. Those of you who are sitting with your legs stretched out, the Arabs have a sitting for that. So if the word was used to describe that, a person who knows Arabic would know that he was sitting with his legs stretched out. The one who is sitting in a way in which he is halfway reclining, the Arabs have a word to describe that particular city. And that brings us to the issue of the hikmah as to why the last religion has been revealed in and by and with the Arabic language because of the precision that's in the language. So one of the characteristics of the Qur'an in terms of convincing people and making al-iqna that the Qur'an is the haq is the language that's in the Qur'an and the language that the Prophet used sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. There's no other language that is similar to the Qur'an, can compete with the Qur'an in its precision and in its detail. At tawarruq is the sitting in which the person makes his prayer and when he comes to the third rakat or the fourth rakat, only in the third rakat or the fourth rakat, he sits in the way that the Prophet showed, displayed, illustrated, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and what the companions describe. That is where the person takes his left leg and he sits under the left leg and he puts the left leg between his thigh and his calf and his right foot is on top of the toes and he sits in that particular way you know how to do that sitting Akhi Abdul Qadir <laughs> so I asked you man <laughs> does anyone know how to sit this way so that we can illustrate 
أخي مختار do it first this is the sitting of a tawarruq so if you, don't do it for me أخي do it for the people who are behind you yeah this is a tawarruq where the left leg is where it is and I said between the calf and the thigh is under the right leg and the right leg is above brother Sharif can you do it for us the reason why we're asking Sharif to do it is for two reasons number one to show that Sharif is much bigger mashallah than Mukhtar so even if a person is bigger you know he has some weight upon him it still can be done that's the first reason and the second reason is that he's like a revert so we don't want people to make distinctions to say reverts don't have to sit that way or Arabs don't have to sit that way or rich people don't have to sit that way everybody is responsible to do his best to sit this way of a tabarruk a tawarruk a tawarruk and as we mentioned, that's in the salat that has three rakat or the salat that has four rakat. So the last way of sitting for salat al-dhuhr, al-asr, al-maghrib, and al-isha is what you just saw, what was just illustrated between those two brothers. For any prayer that is not three or four rakat, you should sit your normal way. Akhi Mukhtar, can you just show the brothers just the normal way? That is not a tawarruk. So the normal way for any prayer that is two rakat is to sit like that and to end up in your prayer just like that. So Salat al-Fajr, all of your nawafil, Salat al-Juma, Salat al-Eid, greeting the masjid, al-Istikhara, any prayer that has two rakat, inshallah, this is the way that the end of the sitting should be. As for the prayers that have three, like Salat al-Maghrib, like Salat al like the Salat of uh, al-Witr, if you make the Witr prayer, then the end result should be at tawarruk for three or for four. If a person doesn't have the ability to do that, like I don't have the ability to do that, if I were to do that in the Salat of Jama'at, I'm going to lean on the person who's on my left side. And he's going to be distracted in this prayer. And Allah doesn't want me to practice this sunnah at the expense of disrupting his prayer. And then he's leaning on the person to his left and he's looking at me while he's praying. This is not how we establish the sunnah. So if a person has the ability to do it, alhamdulillah, if he doesn't have the ability to do it, and he gets in, he fits in, and does the best that he possibly can. If the last third or fourth rakat, he just wants to sit on his feet in a way that is comfortable, then this is okay. But this tawarruq is the prayer of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before we come to the issue of the sajda or the sajda tasahu, which has some details to it, want to move on to a few other points inshallah as we gel because um, as you know on Wednesday we're scheduled to do some of the ahkam of Ramadan in preparation of Ramadan but looking at the schedule with precision we wanted to delay a week or two because some issues are going to come up close to the month of Ramadan that we don't want people to be forgetful about what had already been mentioned and plus we have some other programs that are going to be dealing with some of these issues. So concerning the mistakes of the prayer, we just want to go to the next issue, and that is some of the mistakes that are done in the prayer as it relates to the Salat of al jamaa We mentioned some of those issues when you're praying in the Jama'ah, but we were talking about the Salat of Jama'ah in general, but it also could be the Salat in the Masjid. But today we want to deal with some issues that are specific to the Masjid, some of the mistakes, some of the issues connected to the Masjid. First thing that we want to mention, Ikhwani, is leaving the Masjid after the Adhan has been made. 
many people were not aware that the masjid in al-Islam, it has a lot of rights upon us, things that we can do inside of the masjid and things that we can't do inside of the masjid. So the Muslim is murtabat bi masajid Allah azza wa jalla. He has some connection to the masajid. Do's and don'ts. He'll never come to know about those issues if he or she doesn't read about them and they don't try to get al-fiqh and understanding in these particular issues. And from the don'ts is that once the adhan has been made and a person finds himself in the masjid, then it is not permissible for him to leave the masjid unless he's leaving the masjid for a serious issue. He wants to leave the masjid in order to come back to the masjid. Like the great Tabi and Imam Sa'id ibn al-Musayyib, he had mentioned no one should leave the masjid except the individual who is going out in order to come back or the munafiq. The person who leaves the masjid after the adhan goes off, the one who goes out and he has to go to his car and he has to come back, this is no problem because he left for a reason and came back for the prayer. The one who leaves and he doesn't come back, that is from the actions of the munafiqeen. So if an individual, he had to leave the masjid when the adhan goes off, he gets a call, he gets a text message, someone's in the hospital, his help is needed, his presence is needed in the home, then he can go and he can leave because it, they are extenuating circumstances that are confronting him. Other than that, it's not permissible. The Prophet, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or Abu Huraira saw a man after the adhan had went off and he saw that man leaving the masjid. He said about the man, فَقَدْ عَصَى هَذَا أَبَ Qasim. This man, he has disobeyed Abu Qasim Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alaihi Wasallam. Another issue, the problem with that is it is making like a tashbih with the shaitan. We have not been allowed to resemble the kuffar, now Muslims, and things that are peculiar to them, things that they are known by. We're not allowed to resemble them. Men tashabbaha biqawmin fahu minhum. Anyone who resembles a group of people, then he's from those people. Then if that's the case with the kuffar, then clearly we are not allowed to resemble the shaitan. So there are many a hadith that come to tell us don't do this and don't do that because this is from the characteristics of a shaitan himself. Very quickly, I just want to ask you brothers, anybody in the masjid right now, do you know anything that shaitan is known for that the prophet said, don't do that because shaitan does that? Anybody know anything? Fadl. Yes. The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't wear one shoe. Shaitani walks around with one shoe. So you either walk with both of them or with one of them. One sock or both of the socks. Someone else put his hand up. Don't pray when the sun is coming up and don't pray when the sun is setting because those are the two times that a shaitani makes the salah. Good job. Anybody else? There are many, many issues. Anybody else? Mukhtar. Prophet Sallallahu said, don't eat with your left hand, don't drink with your left hand, don't give with your left hand, don't take with your left hand, because a shaitani does all four of those things. So if a person has a right hand, then he should do all of those things with a right hand. He has only a left hand, then la yukallifu allahu nafsan illa wus'aha. Anybody else? What is something that shaitan does? Huh? Some of the people of Al-Islam say that we shouldn't whistle because the kuffar whistle. Because the kuffar whistle. Their prayer at the Kaaba was nothing but whistling and clapping hands. But that's a description that Allah gave about the kuffar of Quraysh showing they just waste time. But it's not something that is peculiar or specific to the kuffar. Fadl Abu Isa. And that's the point that we were going to do it. And that's the intelligence that I really like about certain people that they are looking, some people looking here and there. But why am I mentioning this? Because of the next point that's coming. From the characteristics of a shaitan, why we don't leave the masjid once the adhan goes off is because when the adhan goes off, the shaitan, he leaves you and he leaves the masjid. And he runs away when he hears the adhan. 
and he just doesn't vacate the premises and he leaves, but he passes gas because he is khabif. He's dirty. He's nasty. So if the person were to leave the masjid after the adhan went off, he is resembling the shaitan and he's resembling the munafiqeen. We're not going to use the weak hadith and the khurafat superstition that some people believe in. There is a hadith that is weak. It's not true. It's a lie. Fabricated. That when an individual, he... Well, we'll come to that, inshallah, Azurjah. So when the person is in the masjid, once the adhan goes off, you have to stay in the masjid. That's a mistake people do. They don't realize that this is something that shouldn't be done. And when Abu Huraira saw the man when he did it, he said, this individual, he has disobeyed the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Another mistake, ikhwani, is the mistake of not greeting the masjid. And we want to repeat this and we want to pass this on to you brothers and encourage you to inform people when you see them coming into the masjid and they sit down without praying to rak'at. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the people that دَخَلَ أَحَدُكُمْ الْمَسْجِدَ فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُصَلِّيَ رَكَعَتَيْنِ Anyone who comes into a masjid, don't sit down until you pray to rak'at. These two rak'at are wajibah. They are an obligation. So we have five prayers that are obligatory in Al-Islam. The five prayers that are done, Fajr, Dhur, Asr, Maghrib, Isha. But there are other prayers that are also an obligation. Like the Juma prayer is an obligation. Like the Eid prayer is an obligation. And from the prayers that are wajib upon us is the two rakat of the masjid. And these two rakats of the masjid, they are from the rights, the many rights that the masjid has upon the Muslim. The masjid doesn't have one or two or three or four rights. The masjid has many rights upon the Muslim man and the Muslim woman. From that is when you enter into the masjid, you shouldn't sit down until you pray two rakat. One of the companions' name is Kumya Abu Qatada radiallahu anhu came into the masjid. He said that he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sitting down and his companions were sitting with him. So he came and he sat with them. The Prophet, when he saw that, he asked the man sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what prevented you from praying to rakat? And this is really important for people who are giving dawah in Allah. When you see something that's going on, don't be too quick to jump in until you find out what's going on. Don't speculate. Don't be too quick to jump in. You don't know. Sometimes the thing is very clear, but many times it's not clear. And one of the worst feelings is a feeling that comes as a result of a person thinking that he sees a munkar, and then when he asks the question, he realizes this wasn't actually munkar. So he asks the question. If he knew, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the ilm al-ghayb, he would have known the reason. So he said to the man, what prevented you from making your two rak'at when you entered into the masjid? He said, I saw you, I saw your companions, and you were sitting down, so I came to sit down. So he commanded him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to go and pray two rak'at, and then to come, and then to join the people that he was, was with. Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, from the companions as well, came into the masjid, he sat down without praying to rakat. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told him, if you come into the masjid, then you should pray to rakat. And there are other hadith for this. We don't have to go through all of the hadith because it is clear. Anyone who comes into a masjid, he should pray to rakat. The only masjid that he doesn't do that in is in Mecca. If he goes to Mecca and he enters into the masjid, he should begin by trying to make seven tawafs. If the adhan goes off before he completes his seven tawafs, no problem. He just goes and he joins the people who are going to pray. If he can complete seven tawafs around the Kaaba, then he goes and he makes two rakat. Come into the Masjid al-Haram in Mecca and just pray in two rakat, this is not the way to greet that masjid. If a person comes 
and he doesn't have time, and he knows he doesn't have time to make the seven to off, then that's a different issue. He should try to get there for all of his prayers. And this is for the people who are going to be blessed with going to Mecca. From the adab of going to Mecca, don't go to the masjid once you hear the adhan. But try to get to that masjid, especially since we're not living there, to try to make seven tawafs. And then after every seven tawafs, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said that the Nabi said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after seven tawafs, every seven tawafs, there are two rakat. So that's the way you deal with the masjid of Al-Haram. Other than that, you make two rakats. If the person enters into the masjid at the time that he doesn't pray, he shouldn't pray. The sun is going up, the sun is going down, something is happening, then he just doesn't pray. He stays standing up until after the adhan goes off. And to show the importance of the issue, Ikhwani, the companion, Sulaik al Ghattafan, doing the Salat of al Juma, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was given the khutbah of al Juma, and that man came in and he sat down to listen to the khutbah. He stopped the khutbah and said, Did you make two rakats? Yes, Sulaik. He said, No. He said, Get up and make them and make them quickly. So on the day of al Juma, where it's not permissible for the people to be speaking about kalam, not connected to the khutbah, and he stopped him in front of all the people, is a clear sign and a clear indication. Last thing we want to mention about this, some of the madahib of the opinion, the person comes to the masjid and he sits down, and then he comes to know about this issue, he doesn't have to get up. Once you sit down, then you don't have to get up. The hadith of Sulaik al-Ghattafan shows that's not correct. The hadith of Abu Qatada shows that's not correct. The hadith of Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, may Allah be pleased with all of them, they came into the masjid, they sat down, Prophet saw it, he mentioned it, and he told them to get up. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. So you can make a tadarub. You forgot about it, you didn't know. You should just get up and you should do it. You shouldn't be sad or embarrassed. The other issue, ikhwani and the amini, connected to the masjid, is about the iqama of the salat. And alhamdulillah, as many of you sit there, I know that many of you already know this. And if I were to compare the condition and the level of you brothers with what our level was back in 1986 when we embraced Islam, you people are far ahead of us. Due to the internet, due to the spread of the sunnah now. The sunnah has spread. Knowledge has spread. And that's one of the signs of Yom al -Qiyama. Back then, you couldn't find this type of information. So as you people are sitting there and you say, wow, most of the stuff that I'm hearing, I already know. Alhamdulillah, you should consider that from the ni'mah that Allah Azza wa has bestowed upon you. And the other issue is, there are people who don't know. There are people other than you who don't know. And that's what we're trying to bring to your attention. Once the adhan goes off for a particular salat, and then the iqama, once the iqama is established, it is not permissible. It is haram and it is a sin for an individual to start praying any prayer once the iqama went off. And usually this problem is a problem that we find with people in regards to Salat of Al-Fajr. There are those people, they know the virtues of Salat of Al-Fajr, the Sunnah, anyone who prays to Raka'at better than the dunya, whatever is in the dunya. Whoever prays 12 Raka'at, other than the five wajib prayers. In one day, if a person prays 12 raka'at, other than the wajib prayer, he will get a house that has been built in Al Jannah. So he heard that. So when the adhan goes off, he starts to pray. Or he hears the adhan and it went off, and he's already praying, he continues to pray. The iqama amen. Once that iqama goes off, then khalas. If you're not at the end of the salat, in the tashahud, just get up. You don't even have to say, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Just get up. Because that iqama has destroyed your prayer. And that's due to the hadith of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, إِذَا أُقِيمَةُ الصَّلَاةَ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةَ إِذَا أُقِيمَةُ الصَّلَاةُ فَلَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا الْمَكْتُوبَةَ 
if the iqama has been established, then there is no salat except that salat that is about to be performed. The linguistics of that hadith, فَلَا salata, There is no salat for the one who is praying. One of the ways we understand that is that that salat that you're praying is batila. Because this la is la and nafi lil jins. The la that negates what it is being used for. La ilaha. There is no God. There are many gods. But there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. So when he said la salata, there is no prayer, even if you're making that prayer. Even if you're sincere about that prayer. Even if you're trying to get the reward of that prayer. La salata. Maktuba. There is no prayer except the one that the iqama has been made for. If you're at the very end of it, then go ahead and finish and that's it. Because by the time the mu'adhan does the iqama, you can get out of the prayer you finish. As for the one who just started and he's in qiyam, he's in ruku', then just get out and you don't even have to say assalamu alaikum because la salata, that prayer that you're praying is not permissible. It's not permissible. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he prayed with the people and a man came in and while he prayed with the people, that man was doing his sunnah prayers of al-fajr. After he finished his prayer, that man got up to complete his prayers. In order to get the sunnah prayers of al-fajr, he missed some of what he should have been doing in the jama'ah. So the Prophet asked him after he finished, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he waited until he finished, and he said, Ah, uh, Salat, Arba'ah, Ah, uh, Salat, Arba'ah, As Subh, Arba'ah, has Salat al Fajr been made four rakats? Is it four rakats? Salat al Subh, Salat al Fajr is not four rakats. The fact that he waited till the man finished and he gave him this information goes to show that it's something that should be avoided, it shouldn't be done. Again, I would advise, when we talk to people, and we educate people about this, like everything else in the dawah, you got to take it easy. People don't know. Many of the people, they're just not aware, and the guy is sincere, so he goes off into the corner just trying to get rewards from Allah Azza wa Jalla. From the mistakes of Khwani and from the masail that should be understood is the issue of eating onions and eating garlic. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam prohibited it. And in prohibiting it, it should be understood. This is not really a complicated issue. But before we mention that, I don't want to forget. When he told the people, if the jama'ah is established, don't make another prayer until except the one that's being established. Goes to show the importance of unity in Islam. The unity of the Muslims. Those people can't be making a prayer while another group of people are making a prayer. You can't be over there by yourself making a prayer while the jama'ah is making a prayer. You have to sacrifice what you're doing in order to come to be with the jama'ah. And that thing that you're doing is good. It's khair. مَا سَجْدَ عَبْدُ لِلَّهِ تَعَالَ سَجْدَةً إِلَّا رُفِعَ بِهَا يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةً Every person who makes a sajda, Allah will raise him up by and with that sajda, yawm al qiyamah. So he's over there and he's making something that's beneficial to him. He's going to be raised up. But more virtuous than that is to stick with the jama'ah, to be with the jama'ah. Not to be with the jama'ah on batil and on dalala and bid'a and shirk, kufr and munkar or ma'asiyah. But to be with the jama'ah in khair. So the Muslim has to realize, and this is a very important point that comes from this hadith and this ruling, you have been commanded to put your individual benefit aside in order to be with the jama'ah of the Muslims and not to sacrifice everything just to do something that you feel is from the sunnah or that is beneficial. Anyway, concerning the eating of onions and garlic, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam mentioned, من أكل من هذه الشجرة 
Fala yakrabanna masjidana. Anyone who eats from the onion tree, the onion vegetable, then don't come to our masjid. Another hadith he mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man akala thawman aw basala fal ya'tazil masjidana wal yaq'ud fi baytihi. Anyone who eats an onion or garlic, then let him not come to our masjid and let him stay in his house and let him sit in his house. The wisdom behind that is the mala'ika of Allah Azza wa Jal, they are annoyed by smells that are not nice. In al mala'ika, tata'adha mimma yata'adhu minhu banu Adam, they are annoyed and they are bothered by the same things that Bani Adam are annoyed and they are bothered with. But the meaning in the fiqh of the hadith is if an individual knows that he's going to come to the masjid, then he should avoid eating raw onions and he should avoid eating raw garlic. If he eats onions or garlic that have been cooked and doesn't leave any smell in his mouth, it's permissible for to eat and to come. But that's provided that it's been cooked and it's not going to give off any fragrance or any smell. And from the benefits of this, Ikhwani, is that it goes to show again that Al-Islam takes into consideration and it tells us to take into consideration the feelings of other people. Al-Islam is about al-nadhafa, about cleanliness. Al-Islam is about husn al having good character in all of its shape, forms, fashions, every display and manifestation of this particular issue. So don't bother other people with bad smells. The masjid is the place of unity. The masjid is the place of a salah. Whatever compromises that, Al-Islam said, don't do it. Don't do it. Similar to the issue of onions and garlic, any and everything that has bad smells, like the bad smell that comes from a person who has body odor. He's not taking care of his personal hygiene. So as a result of that, what comes from him is a smell that is repugnant or offensive. This is the same ruling. He didn't eat any onions. He didn't eat any garlic. But the smell that's coming from him is worse than the onion or the garlic. So therefore, he should be on top of his hygiene. People who have bad odor in their feet, he has to do something about that situation. Even if the people who are standing may not be able to smell that from him, but walking in the masjid, praying in the masjid, it leaves that repugnant smell. The Muslim has to make it his business to try to make the izala and to get rid of those particular issues. And that's why from his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, from his sunnah was, before praying, he used to do the masjid his mouth. He said that there is an angel from the mala'ika, when a person stands to start praying, that angel puts his mouth to the mouth of the prayer and he takes in his recitation of the Quran. Now we come to this issue of the fake hadith, fabricated hadith. Some people, when they want to prove this point that we shouldn't pollute the masjid with bad smells, some of them include passing wind. If you have the ability not to pass wind in the masjid, then you shouldn't do it. And the wind that you have, that you want to pass, sometimes we know, we have an idea how it's going to smell, and sometimes we don't know. person has a problem, he's eating a particular thing, so when he passes wind, he has an idea how it's going to be. If his situation is like that, then he has to be connected to the mala'ika. He has to be connected to the people. So if he wants to pass wind, no one said that he can't pass wind. But well, the scholars of Islam said for this individual he should exit the masjid so as not to annoy the people, not to annoy the mala'ika. Then he makes his wudu and he comes back. As for the individual who, it comes out like that against him involuntarily, it comes out and he has a feeling it's not going to smell that bad, then inshallah has no problem. But for the people who tried to use the weak hadith, fake hadith, abrogated hadith, there are some people who use a hadith that it says, Whenever someone wants to pass wind, there is an angel that Allah created that when he passes wind, the angel puts his mouth where the wind is going to come out. And then the angel takes that smell in his mouth and then the angel goes out and then he is disintegrated. 
And the people believe in that. Khurafat. Who has the ability to disintegrate the malaika? We know that you can harm a jinn. You can harm a jinn. And you may not know that you've harmed the jinn. But who can harm the malaika in that type of way? You harm them in the smells, but do you disintegrate them? No, 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 no. This is something that we don't believe in. This is something that we don't support. We don't build any ahkam upon this type of khurafat. So mainly, ikhwani, the issue is don't come to the masjid with bad, repugnant smells. From them, cigarettes and the smell that is on the person's body after smoking cigarettes, which is something that is haram, or any and every smell that is not permissible. I remember when we used to live in Al Medina, there's a lot of construction that's going up all over the place, and a lot of Pakistani people, a lot of Muslims who come from other countries, are there building as builders. And some of the people were working, that's their job to build. The clothes that they had on was very dirty, and there were repugnant smells. And when you have a group of them, all of them building the building right in front of the masjid, and then they all come into the masjid, our brothers, there was a terrible smell as a result of that. And it was something that was disturbing. This is something that we don't deal with for the most part here, but why I'm mentioning that is an individual, he has a job, and his job is that he collects the rubbish, he collects the, the, the garbage. And as a result of collecting the garbage, garbage or whatever job he's doing he's very sweaty and he has a nasty odor in these issues don't come to the masjid unless you come to the masjid in a way where you change your clothes or bring some perfume in preparation not to annoy the malaika of Allah azawajal, not to annoy the people who are praying in the masjid from these issues ikhwani and this is really important is the itmam of the sufuf we have this problem in this masjid right now, and we have it every day for every prayer. It's not exclusive to us, but it's the tahawan and the negligence about this issue. And that is the completion, the completion of the sufuf. This is a really important issue. From the mistakes of the musallin is not completing the saf in the prayer. It's not permissible for a person to bring his son or his daughter to the masjid. And there are little kids who are standing next to him in the prayer. Adam, that brother right there, has his daughter. He has his son. His son is old enough to know what he's doing. He has will do. He steps next to his father and he prays next to his father standing there. As for his daughter on the other side, you, the neighbor of Abu Adam, you have to say, she can't be here. She has to go back there. She has to go over there. She has to do something. Don't bring your children to make the salat. If your children don't know what they're doing in the prayer, they don't have the salat. There's something in our masjid every single day for every single prayer. And it's our responsibility as individuals to eradicate this problem because we're responsible for the salat. The Nabi and what was collected by the Imam Muslim, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said, according to what Jabir ibn Abdullah mentioned, may Allah be pleased with him, Will you people not line up the way the malaika line up to their Lord when they're going to pray, when they're going to worship him? The companions say, Ya Rasulullah, how is it that the malaika line up? How do the malaika line up? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, يَتِمُّونَ الصُّفُوفِ الْأَوَّلْ بِالْأَوَّلْ the malaika, when they line up to pray in front of Allah, جل, they complete the prayer. They complete the row. They complete the first row, and then the second row, and then the third row, and on and on and on. They don't start the second row until the first row is complete. He used to tell the people before the prayer that the straightening of the row and the completion of the row is from the Complete and perfect prayer. So everyone's participating in this prayer. So everyone should be haris, trying to get the reward of that salat in the jama'at. He can't just come focused on himself saying, I'm praying in the jama'at, that's it. Your responsibility, our responsibility goes beyond that. If there's a space 
you have to rectify. If the line is crooked, that's everybody's responsibility to say something. After saying something, the people don't take it, then in this case, nafsi nafsi. I'm worried about myself now. I gave the da'wah to the issue, and that's it. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, he told the companions before praying one time, uqimu sufufakum fa inni arakum min wara'i dhahri. He said, straighten up your roles because I see you from behind my back when I'm praying. Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, when the Prophet told the people, straighten up your roles, he said, I saw, Anas said, I saw that each and every body person in the prayer, he will put his heels to the heel of the next person, to his right and his left. He will put his shoulder to the shoulder of the person to him, right and the left. This is a sunnah that is part of the prayer that should be done and people were trying to practice the sunnah without going overboard, we should spread this sunnah. It's something that's amazing. Then the masjid of the people of the sunnah were mutahawinun. Now, don't get me wrong, and I'm not saying like I've seen in some of the masjid, there's some gulu. I went to a masjid, people were ignorant in the masjid. They were students in a place called Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh. It's a sunnah masjid. The imam before starting, he took about 15 minutes to straighten everybody out. 20 minutes. And he would go down the row, pushing, pulling, pushing, pulling. Go down the second row, pushing, pulling, pushing. And then the, made the people uncomfortable. Made the people because of their lack of knowledge. And also, it doesn't take 15, 20 minutes for that. And made the people look at that application of the sunnah and his people as being strange. I don't say take 15, 20 minutes. But I say that we should give this issue some time. And everybody who's in the role from the people of the sunnah, the people who know, don't be afraid and don't be shy and don't be embarrassed to let it be known. Straighten out the line. Hey, hey, you, get over there. Don't be shy, don't be afraid, and don't be hesitant. Anas ibn Malik was asked about this issue by one of the tabi'een. The man's name was Bashir ibn Yasir. Bashir ibn Yasir said to Anas ibn Malik, do you criticize us, the people, for anything today that you used to do during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and we're not doing it right now? Anas told the man, ma ankartu, ma ankartu, illa nakum la tuqimun as-sufuf. I don't criticize you people for anything other than you're not paying attention to straightening out the lines. So during the time of the companions, when he used to say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, straighten out your roles, they took it seriously. One companion would go down that line, the other one would go down that side, and it would straighten it out. So it's an important issue. And in it is a lot of benefit. Now is not the time to get in all of those beneficial issues, but I just want to mention a few. Number one, the straightening of the lines, it does away with the ikhtilaf that are in the hearts of the people. The straightening of the lines, when people do that, it is one of the ways. How is it a way? Allah knows best. But he used to tell the people, if you don't straighten out the lines, Allah will cause your hearts to be divided. And this is the ikhtilaf that we have. So this is one of the ways each individual, when he is straightening out the line, his need is, I don't want to be one of the people that cause unnecessarily ikhtilaf. I want to fix it. So the least that he does, he gets proper with the man next to him, right and left, and tells the people who are there. So he's doing something calling to unity. Another benefit of an ikhwani is the one who straightens out the line, especially if he takes a step to do so, it's one of the ways that your affairs will be rectified. Those of you who want to pass the exam, those of you who want a better job, those of you who want a job, those of you who have goals, objectives, aspirations, the Prophet told the people, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever connects the line, Allah will connect his affairs. Whoever breaks the line, Allah will break his affair. So the issue, the person has an issue in his life. Like I give an example. He looks at his mundane. I want to send my children to Islamic school, 
but also Islamic school has some problems. I want to send them to the non-Muslim school and I'm trying to make a decision. Should I do this? Should I do that? Okay. While you're trying to figure the issue out, be one of those people who when you come to the masjid, if you see there's a space, connect that line. And those affairs of yours that you're trying to get connected, which school should I send my child to? Which car should I buy? Should I do this? Should I do that? Allah is rejected because of that niyat, because of what the Prophet said. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he'll bring your issues together. From the benefits, Allah is rejected and the malaika, they send salawat on the people who straighten out the lines, who connect the lines. And the salawat, like when we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad as salawat. Inna Allah wa malaikatu yusalluna ala nabi as salawat. Allah sends the salawat on the people, means what? He forgives them. The angels make dua for them. So that's all from the benefits of straightening out the line. In the steps that we make during the course of the day, Akhwani, there's no step that a person makes that's better than the step that he takes to straighten out the line. The other good step is to step for jihad fi sabili that when he goes out. And there are other steps coming to the masjid, and that is khair, going to visit your relatives, and that is khair, going to the janazah, and that is khair, getting rid of the, mu'r, the, the munkar to establish and replace it with ma'roof. That's a step that is khair. He said the best step is the step that a person makes to straighten out the line. So don't see it as something that is insignificant. Concerning the straightening of the line, those people who love the sunnah, there's a person who is muhib the sunnah. He is muhib sunnah. He loves the sunnah. He wants to straighten out the line. We want to advise the people who look at that individual who's trying to stick, straighten out the line in a crazy way. Anas ibn Malik, when Bashir ibn Yasir asked him, what do you criticize us for? He said, I criticize you people because you don't straighten out the line. In another narration, he said, today, Anas ibn Malik said, today, if a person goes to straighten out the lines with the people, the people will look at him as if he is a himar shumps, like he's a wild donkey. If someone comes and says, achi, achi, move up, move forward, move up, a person will look at him and say, mind your own business, what are you doing? Let's just pray. And the people will be in a position where they make inkar on him. And all he's trying to do is get his affairs connected. All he's trying to do is bring unity with the community. Al-Jihad, Al-Jihad, Al-Khilaf, Al-Khilafa. Yeah, he just straighten the lines out, man. Just straighten, just straighten out the lines and have mercy upon your head. And don't break the horns on your head. Do the simple ibadah in the masjid. Simple ibadah. Straighten out the line. That's it. It's easy. So we want to advise those people, ikhwani, who look at the individuals who are trying to do this, speak about it, and they're trying to implement it. Don't be like that. Because the Prophet spoke specifically to the whole community, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and he used to say, Linu bayna aidi ikhwani kum. When your brother is trying to straighten out the line and he's trying to come together, the Prophet said, accommodate him. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. He said in an authentic hadith, khiyarukum alyanakum manaqibin fi salat. The best of you are those people who when they're praying, they're easy when people are trying to connect to them. Subhanallah. You go to some masajid, some people, the medhat. The medhat makes the person hate the one who's trying to straighten out the line and become feet to feet, shoulder to He hates that. So if you are the individual who's confronted with that, let your knee be for Allah. Have ikhlas. Relax, relax. Some people, when we go into some of these masajid of the ahnaf, for an example, our brothers from the Muslims who don't put a lot of emphasis like it should be on these issues, and in their medhab, they want to be away from you. Some people take it personally and they don't like it. And during the duration of the salat, he's preoccupied with this issue. No, leave it. You tried, 
You try. Get it out of your mind. Don't worry about it. And as I told you, when you make rukur, should you be looking at your foot and his foot? That's a part. And becoming more upset. Wukar. When you're making wudu, when you're making rukur, you told the guy before the salat, put your feet together. And he looks at you as if you're a donkey that is wild. And he doesn't put his foot next to your foot. So you start praying. And then you go into rukur. Do you look in rukur at his foot and your foot and the space that's between and you get upset? Do you do that? You don't do that. Where should you look? You should be looking in the place of the sajda. Just preoccupy yourself with what Allah made you responsible for and that's it. So the Nabi, he mentioned, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, man sadda furjatan rafa'ullahu ta'ala biha daraja bana lahu baytan fil jannah. Someone's going to come and they're going to say, we have bigger issues to deal with. We have bigger fish to fry. And I agree that there are some big issues, big issues in the religion. But look what he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyone who brings the space together, anyone who does that, Allah Azza wa will raise him a daraja and Allah will build for him a house in al-jannah. So that just makes a person say, okay, look, I'm not trying to go overboard, but I'm also not embarrassed about trying to get a house in Jannah. You're not going to make me embarrassed. I want to get a house in Jannah. And this individual, he may not even know about that reward. Allah raises him in Daraja because he's trying to close the line and fill in the space. He doesn't even know about it. He doesn't even know there's a house waiting for you in Jannah. So I ask you, brothers, if you go to a masjid, all of the people in the masjid, none of them are aware that if you try to Close the line. You'll get a daraja and a house in Jannah. Who in his right mind is going to waste time saying for one minute, all oh, these people, this, this, he's just going to say, look, I'm going to do it in a nice way. And if they don't get with the program, then alhamdulillah. Lastly, Akhwani, from the mistakes, and all of you should take responsibility for this as well. The imams of our masjid, they are... Just uh, human beings like everybody else. They can give and get, receive, da'wah Allah and nasiha. Any and everybody. Abu Isa can advise any imam in this masjid. Sharif can advise. Abdul Qadir, Adwi. You can advise any imam in this masjid. When you see that the imam in a masjid starts to pray off and he just says, Allahu Akbar. It's from your hop to go to him in a nice way and to explain to him, hey, are you aware that you're responsible for this masjid? You're responsible for the prayer, the taswir to sufuf, closing the lines, the children that are in the prayer, all of these things that are going on in the prayer. So you advise him, pull him to the side, not in front of the people, not to put him down, but in the way where you're going to get the reward. So that's from the mistakes in the Salat al Jama'ah. That many of the imma in Al Islam don't pay attention to this issue at all. I went to a place over the weekend, and there were a lot of youngsters in the masjid. And they were pretty wild. I mean, they were very young, many of them. When it was time for the salat, the muaddin made the adhan. Doing the adhan, everybody was talking. Many people were talking. Could barely hear the adhan. When it was the qama after the qama, the imam said Allahu Akbar. When he said Allahu Akbar. You can still see people talking to each other in the line. Just talking. Now, it's everybody's responsibility to say, we're about to pray. Let me get it together. Let me. That's not the case. Because people forget. And we have to make the dhikr. And that's the imam's responsibility more than anyone else. But it doesn't exempt the other people from taking on board this responsibility. And Allah's a'la and alam. If you brothers have any questions, inshallah, any corrections, any comments, you can make them now. The canon to come shake. تفضل يا أخي تفضل If a person misses the two rakat of al-fajr and he prayed the fajr prayer that is wajib and then the people completed the fajr prayer is it allowed for him to get up and to make up the fajr prayer? The answer Allahumma na'am it's permissible for him to get up and to do it because of the hadith of the virtues. Rakat al-fajr khayru min al-dunya wa ma fiha. 
Those two rakat are better than the dunya and everything in it. So if you missed it for a reason, you came late, you woke up late, you arrived late, no problem. Then get up and you pray it. And the Prophet saw a person doing that, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He prayed, jama'at, fajr, got up, was exiting the masjid. He saw a man was praying. He waited for him. And again, the sunnah is that the Prophet used to be haris, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Haris is the person is trying to give dawah every opportunity. He doesn't just, oh, it's a small thing. He wants to give dawah. He waited. When the man finished, Ajuirat al Fajr or Asub Arba'an, has Fajr prayer been made for? He said, No, I missed it. The two rakat before I came in. So I was making it now. And he just was quiet and he left, showing his tacit approval. So it's something that could be done, should be done. And if he doesn't want to make it in the masjid at that time because he wants to make dhikr, he can stay sitting making dhikr. He could do it. And he can do the two rakas after the sun comes up. And he can do those two rakas after that or when he goes home. All of that is permissible. Any more questions, Akhwani? No, not when he goes home because it's the tahiyyatu of the masjid. Not when he goes home. Any more questions? Fadli Akhi. Yeah, the wajib, the definition of the wajib, the wajib is a thing that if you don't do it, you are sinning. The haram thing is, the wajib thing is, the thing if you don't do it, you are sinning. So, and the haram is a thing that if you do it, you are sinning, the opposite. If you do it, you are sinning. And to leave it, you are rewarded. As for the issue of salat, if the person doesn't make those two rakat, it is a sin. It is a dhamb masiyah now. Any more questions? Fadda ni akhi. There's a lot of ikhtilaf when the iqam is made and a person is praying what should be one done what not to be done. Some of the ulama of the opinion, once that iqamah goes off, khalas, no matter where you are in that sunnah prayer, is done. Because the hadith said, la salata. So it destroys that prayer. No salat. And you already got the reward because your niyyah was to make it, so you're going to get the reward. So it's beyond your control. Don't worry about it. Just get up and go. Other scholars said, no, if he is in the beginning of the prayer and he won't be able to finish that prayer before the salat begins because there's virtues in the takbiratul ihram, trying to get the takbiratul ihram and get into the prayer before the recitation of the Quran, there's rewards in that. So they said, if you can do that, then go ahead and finish. If you can't do that, then get out of it. So there's no clear hadith from the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say, if you're in the first rakat, stop. If you're in the last rakat, stop. All you have is ijtihad and the efforts of the ulama of al-Islam. And then Sharif and Asit. Tfadda ya The red onions. No, the hadith is not telling you you can't eat onions. Onions have benefits in it. Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim in his book, Atib al-Nabawi, brings the benefits of onions. Onions have a lot of benefit in it. Muslims knew that from a long time ago. So you eat all of the onions that you want until you become onion head. No problem. Onions is okay. But don't eat onions when you come into the masjid. That's the issue. That are raw. For the last question. This question, lastly, Ikhwani, the sitting between the two sajdas is the regular sitting, not a tawarruq. It's not 
at tawarruq where you sit naturally like the brother Abu Sa'id Mukhtar, like he showed you, Abu Mukhtar, it's just a regular sitting. So you don't do a tawarruq between the sajdatain. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam mubarak ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi jma'in. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله يا أن الصلاة يا أن الصلاة يا على الفلاح يا على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين والسماء ذات البروج واليوم الموعود وشاهد ومشهود قتل أصحاب الأخدود النار ذات الوقود إذ هم عليها قعود 
وهم على ما يفعلون بالمؤمنين شهود وما نقموا منهم إلا أن يؤمنوا بالله العزيز الحميد الذي له ملك السماوات والأرض والله على كل شيء شهيد إن الذين فتنوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات ثم لم يتوبوا فلهم فلهم عذاب جهنم ولهم عذاب الحريق إن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات لهم جنات لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار ذلك الفوز الكبير الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله اكبر الله الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين انعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين امين ان بطش ربك لشديد إنه هو يبدئ ويعيد وهو الغفور الودود ذو العرش المجيد فعال لما يريد هل أتاك حديث الجنود فرعون وثبود بل الذين كفروا في تكذيب والله من ورائهم محيط بل هو قرآن مجيد في لوح محفوظ الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله الله أكبر
الله أكبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله سمع الله لمن حمده الله الله أكبر الله الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله الله